viewers, welcome back. Welcome to the part two of our video lecture series. This is still in continuation of our unit two. And uh, the last uh, slide that we had in the first uh, video lecture series or the first part is, of course, about tanka poetry. And this time, let's try to take a look at the different forms of poetry. Let's start first with acrostic. Acrostic, it's very common, and I believe you have done this perhaps um, in your previous uh, years in the college. So, and also you have done this to dedicate a poem to a special someone or to a thing or your, you know, pets. You, could, you can do that because acrostic, it is any poem in which the first letter of each line definitely forms a word or word. So, often we form you know, names here. And the longer acrostic poems can create entire sentences from the first letter of each line, and we have here a sample. And also take note that acrostic poems, they are free to rhyme or not rhyme, and can be actually metered or free verse. And we have here an example, for example, cats, and we also have here the word fall. So for cats, so, you know, cuddly, acrobatic, tenacious, softly purring, and then we have fall, um, fresh apples, lots of colors, leaves falling down, so you can, you know, even your name, you know, if you're like your mother is having a birthday, you can create a poem out of her name, and then each letter, or the first letter of each line of the poem you made definitely stands to the letters of your mother's name, or your father's name, or whoever that special person, or pet, or animal may be, you know. So the second is ballad. The ballad is a narrative poem, and the stanzas with two or four lines, and possibly this actually um, a poem that deals with a folklore or popular legends, and this is made to be sung. And ballads are constructed of alternating lines of four and three beats. Okay, and the lines are usually, this is the usual, um, it's a yambic, but it's actually not really have to be. And this is um, accordion-like construction. It creates actually a, a lilting or a sing-song style. So example is the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Coleridge. And we can take a look at here, okay? So I want you to definitely uh, try to read this poem. So capture this portion of the slide and read this poem and try to see or perhaps um, observe the poem of Coleridge, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, and um, compare it with the definition of the word ballad. Okay, so this will be your task. Next, let's proceed with um, blank verse. Blank verse class, it is a poetry that has no set stanzas or line length, so it's up to you how many um, stanzas you are going to make. So it is a common form of poetry seen often, you know, in Shakespeare's poems, Milton, Yeats, Auden, Stevens, and Frost. And a great deal of the greatest literature in English has been written in blank verse. So it is unrhymed lines that follow a strict rhythm, and the rhythm that definitely is usually followed by a blank verse is a yambic pentameter. So I believe um, uh, with the... Uh, with regards or in line with the definition, this black verse is definitely not so strict in terms of the set of stanzas or line length. But what is really being um, so strict um, when we are going to look at black verse is that it has very, um, very stiff rhythm or very strict rhythm, no? Usually a yambic pentameter. Anyway, if I believe you have already also learned about rhythm um, in your previous literature classes, so probably you can uh, go along, and also we will discuss this uh, further as we go along. Uh, we can discuss this later as we go along with our um, lesson. So this is blank verse. An example of unrhymed iambic pentameter is John Milton's Paradise Lost, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woo with the loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seed. So this is an example of 
um, blank verse, and this is in iambic pentameter. So, uh, of course, you have to take a look at lang and always remember because what we need to really think of you para makahinungdum ta our keywords. So, so kung ingat blank verse, this is very strict in terms of rhythm, but in terms of line and stanza, no. Okay, so you have all the freedom as the poet. And when we say acrostic, okay, bana mo, we form na siya sa name. If we are going to take or extract each or the first letter in, um, the first letter of each line in the poem. And then we also have the ballad. It's a narrative, okay? And the focus of this narrative um, poetry is, of course, the folklore and natay mga legends, and it is meant to be sung. Okay, and it has also specific lines. No? And then we do have here, of course, our blank verse. And next is Sing Cane. So Sing Cane here, it's an American poem, and this is influenced by the Japanese haiku. Previously, we already discussed about Japanese haiku. Sing Cane's class are usually light verse, and it is used to express the brief thoughts or moments. Um, it utilizes few adverbs and adjectives, but it definitely work with a lot of nouns and verbs. And syncades have a strict syllabic count, and it should be followed. So the poem is five lines and 22 syllables long. So there should only be five lines, and you have to have 22 syllables long. Similar with haiku, that haiku has a very strict um, structure in terms of the number of syllables. So, and we know that it's 575 for the haiku. And it need not follow any metric pattern, so you don't have. Though what is common is um, iambic syncane. And the first line of the poem is two syllables. Okay. Then the second line, four. The third is six. The fourth is eight. And the final line has two. So if we are going to add no, two plus four, this is six. Plus six, that is 12. 12 plus eight. That is 20, and then 20 plus 2, of course, 22. So take a look at lang. You have to consider, kung makakita mo any class, um, this kind of poetry, and following all the definitions, then that is an example of a sing -kay. Okay, so we have to have a very strict, uh, we need to be very strict in terms of syllabic count. So for example, uh, we do have here, um, these be three silent things, the falling snow, the hour before the dawn, the mouth of one just dead. This is by Adelaide Crapsey. So let's try to take a look at how many syllables. So two syllables. One, these be, that is two, no? And then four, dapat ang next. Three silent si things, or oh, four. This should be six. The falling snow the hour yes six and then b for the dawn the mouth of one just dead okay all in all tanisha okay so of course um total niya is 22. then we have the elegy elegy class this is a poem of lament and praise and consolation and this is um, usually commonly formal, and this is about the death of a particular person. So, it is born the passing of events or passions, and elegies are seldom without form, though the form varies from poem to poem. So, we know that elegy, it is um, very, it's a poem that we should always remember. It is created to talk about or for the death of a particular person. Okay, so let's try to take a look at this video. And as the flames glide high into the night, to the light, the sacrificial rite, I saw Satan laughing with delight the day the music died. He was singing bye-bye, Miss American Pie, drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. Them good old boys were drinking whiskey and rye and singing, this will be the day that I die. This will be the day that I die. It's Don McLean's 1971 song, American Pie, about the death of Buddy Holly. 
Richie Vallon, and the Big Bopper in a 1959 plane crash mourns the loss of three talented musicians, as well as the end of an optimistic and idealistic era in America. And while McLean has never specifically offered his personal interpretation of the song's lyrics, it is widely believed that it serves as an elegy depicting his grief over Buddy Holly's death. Chances are you've heard the word elegy before, and you know it has something to do with remembering a person who has died. And you'd be correct. An elegy is a reflective poem that laments the loss of someone or something. Okay, always remember a reflective poem that laments the loss of someone or something. So it does not only mean class nga, we kind of lament or we mourn over the loss of people, diba? We also mourn over the loss of our pets or our uh, whatever it is that we are taking good care of. It depends on how sentimental we, you are as a person. Okay, so let's continue. Of course, losing someone can refer not only to death, but simply an absence. As a result, elegies can be used to mourn the death of a person, the breakup with a lover, the end of an idealistic era, or even the trading in of your dream car for the family-style minivan. So, you might be listening to this and thinking, this sounds like a eulogy. What's the difference? Well, let's clear that up before we move on. An elegy and a eulogy are so similarly spelled and used that they can easily be misunderstood, but their differences are fairly easy to identify. First, they are different forms of writing. Whereas an elegy is a poem or even a song, a eulogy is written as an essay or a short piece of prose. In other words, one is written in stanzas, while the other is written in paragraphs. The second major difference is in the tone the author's attitude toward the subject of the piece. In an elegy, the speaker is lamenting the loss of the person who has passed. In this case, we have a tone of remorse. The eulogy takes a lighter approach and seeks to reminisce about the person's best qualities during their life on Earth. This creates a tone of respect. So Don McLean's American Pie can qualify as an elegy because of its poetic structure and is of glaic tone. As with most forms of poetry, the structure defined by the elegy has changed over time. Like the song American Pie, more modern elegies deal with a more philosophical sadness and a broad sense of loss. Just as Don McLean mourns the loss of America's optimistic era, other poets have lamented on the horrors of war, as in Paul Selen's Fuge of Death, for the cruelty imposed on the victims of the Holocaust. Traditional elegies, though, were more focused and more structured. Mostly these involved either public figures or someone of personal significance. And while not all elegies of the past had only three stanzas, many traditional elegies were arranged by the three stages of loss, lament, praise, and solace. An example of this is Walt Whitman's O Captain, My Captain, an elegy written about Abraham Lincoln. Whitman's first stanza laments the loss of Lincoln, saying, O oh heart, 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 as he sees the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. The second stanza looks to praise Lincoln with the flag is flown, for you the bugle trills, bouquets and ribboned wreaths, and eager faces further pay tribute to Lincoln's life. The final stanza offers some solace in that the ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done, even though the rest of the lines are still quite mournful. The overall tone of this traditional elegy is one of heartfelt remorse for the loss of such a great leader. So an elegy is a reflective poem that laments the loss of someone or something and differs from a eulogy in form and tone. While modern elegies are loosely structured and have a more broad sadness, traditional elegies follow the three stages of loss, lament, praise, and solace. Among these traditional elegies is Walt Whitman's O Captain, My Captain, which mourns the death of Abraham Lincoln. All right, so I believe uh, the video that I showed to you earlier definitely um, gives us a very detailed discussion about elegy and it also compares um, elegy and eulogy. So what is the difference between elegy and eulogy? 
and we definitely know that allergy is verse in form or in structure while um, this theology it is prose so by then um, allergy with that allergy is formed through stanzas and lines while eology is formed through paragraphs and also allergy is heavier or it is definitely heavier compared to eology because eology is lighter you know the approach it actually is a torn um, eology is a tone of respect that is the focus to tone of respect for the person so looking back and reminiscing all the good things this person has done while this person still was on earth while elegy is more of a tone of remorse okay or uh shall we say so poem or song yeah in this case we have a tone of remorse yes exactly tone of remorse so that is the difference between the two and also elegy is um divided or the two kinds we do have the modern and the traditional so i believe it's very detailed and well presented so let's proceed now oh let's proceed now and to as the flames um epic so epic the epic is a long narrative narrative poem that usually unfolds the history or mythology of a nation or race Okay, class. So I think there is still um, something that we have to take a look at on. Okay, anyway. Anyway, I'm sorry for that. So the epic class, it's a long narrative poem that usually unfolds a history or mythology of a nation or race. And the epic details the adventures and deeds of a hero. And in so doing, tells the story of a nation. The oldest form of poetry, if we are going to date back, uh, looking into the classics, we do have the Gilgamesh, the Iliad, and Beowulf. Though too long to be excerpted here, any of these works would serve as fine examples of an epic. No? Epics often follow a recognizable pattern, but there is no set pattern, and the form actually changes because it depends on the culture and the language. So it's very... real. Um, shall we say um it it depends or it's very dependent on the culture and the language where this particular epic um originates or definitely takes place so this is a long narrative poem and it's usually about history or mythology of a nation or race so i believe you definitely um are familiar of beowulf even gilgamesh the epic of gilgamesh and Iliad as well is also familiar to you so characteristics of an epic poem it incorporates myth legend folk tale and history it has a grand tone and also heroes and their um adventures appear larger than life so the adventures here and then many were drawn from oral tradition. And of course, from the Old English, we have very famous Beowulf. Okay, this is an epic poem, of course, in um, Old English. So also, we do have also our very own um, epic, definitely, you know, the Ang um, Bilamang, if you could remember that. When we were in elementary, I don't know with your, you know, generation, but of course we in, in my generation we were you know taught about um this particular we were taught about um this particular epic long time ago so um we do have here viewers for the old english for the philippines i remember the Agnilama. it's an epic and Beowulf class, uh, the writer of Beowulf is unknown. So, epistle, epistle. Let's try to take a look at epistle here. Poems written in the form of a letter are called epistles. Epistle can adhere to form or can be free of meter and rhyme. And one of the better known epistle is Alexander Pope's epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot. So, um, poems written in the form of a letter are called epistles. So, this is Saint Paul writing his epistles, and this is Alexander Pope. So, it is 
free of meter and rhyme as well. So now we'll proceed with um, limerick. So limerick, it is a short humorous form known for off-color statement. So again, this limerick is kind of similar with the other short poems that we have already tackled, where they are very much structured in terms of the number of lines so limerick is a five line poem with meter and rhyme and the first second and fifth lines they are all iambic tetrameter with end rhyme while the third and the fourth lines they are all iambic trimeter and rhyme with each other but not the other three lines so for example this one here we do have here a certain uh, rhyme scheme okay so a a b b a okay so they have here end rhyme and end rhyme it is a kind of rhyme that appears by the end of the line so for example what is a limerick mother it's a form of verse said brother in which lines one and two rhyme with five when it's through and three and four rhyme with each other so this is an, a five line poem a five line poem where it rhymes in line one two and five so line one two and five have the same um, um, sound while la rhyme why why lines three and four and four also are another rhyme okay so the following is an example of a limerick and this is written by Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling uh, Rudyard Kipling is a very famous writer so we do have here there's a poet with pencil held stiff of his brilliance i once got a whiff his jungle book story earned ever much glory and he famously wondered what if okay i believe it's really uh, very cool to create limericks okay they are short you know same with haiku and uh, definitely we know exactly what to do but because we are very guided in terms of the number of lines and also in terms of the rhyme so um it's very structured as well so ode ode written in praise of a person an object or an event odes tend to be longer in form and generally serious in nature and patterns of the stanzas within an ode follow no prescribed pattern and a well-known example of an ode would be ode on grecian urn by john keats so there are still a lot of ode okay old class is when you praise somebody it can be an object or it can be an event so you are going to create an ode so you say an ode to my cell phone okay an ode on okay an ode to I, an ode for my mother and or an ode um an ode on on my brother's pet so like that okay anyway that's it for this part. We, I will continue discussing the forms of poetry on the third part of our video, le video lecture series for Unit 2. Thank you very much, guys, for listening. Bye, everyone. See you on the third um